wouldn't you say that that because you come from an artistic background, I mean, you're an artist, at, and and wouldn't you say that that's how you would probably pr uh, approach producing a song or writing a song? I mean, exactly like you make, you know, to me, it's like, I make the music that I want to hear, you know, like I, I'll be, that's being an artist to me is it's like, you make the best thing that you can possibly, you're your own worst critic. I, remember, I won't name the artist, but I remember hearing an artist say, I write songs for my fans. I don't write songs for me, like the kind of music that, you know, sure. or whatever. I write songs for my fans because I want them to have fun. I'm like, oh God, I don't want to listen to your music. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I want to hear you, man. You know, I want to hear what you do, you know, not because that just seems vapid to me to do. You, you just brought up something which I think you can speak to really powerfully about is when I interviewed Michael Beinhorn and he talked about working with, uh, with, with Soundgarden, and I know you can speak to this for obvious reasons, he said that that was actually something Chris was battling with because they were a, they were a, a credible, incredible rock band. You know, you listen to Soundgarden, they're a rock band that anybody who loves rock music could just fall in love with. The world-class singer that can stand shoulder to shoulder with with Robert Plant and 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 all of the greats. You know, he can be a Roger Daltrey, Robert Plant, you know, Steven Tyler, Chris Cornell. I mean, they're all like interchangeable as some of the greatest rock singers ever. And when Michael said he got the first demos, he's like, these are really good, but I, I they, they don't sound like you and and chris said he he said that chris came back and said yeah i, I you know we're a grunge band now <laughs> and he's like what do you mean he goes well you know grunge is big so i'm writing grunge songs and he said well what do you listen to and he goes well i love cream i love the beatles i love zeppelin and he's like well write those songs and he goes yeah that's what i want to do and that's what i normally do but and and that sort of re had him refocus back so yeah, I, I get it. I mean, even somebody as insanely talented as Chris Cornell, one of the greatest rock singers that ever lived, had that same battle. Yeah, um, which I think maybe that album, because he, by the way, Michael was here once not that long ago, and uh, he, he sort of relayed the same story to me about, uh, and, and he said that Chris went home that night and wrote Black Hole Sun, I think. Uh, and yeah. after saying, just do what you want, man. And then he was like, what? You gotta be kidding me. This is amazing. When Michael heard what he came up with after <laughs> that. Um, it's awesome. yeah, you know, I think Chris, um, he, oh, well, I mean, I can only relate some stuff that he told me. I remember having a phone conversation with him where it was frustrating for him that people wanted him to do because he had such a deep appreciation for, you know, Elvis Costello and punk rock and yeah. and Led Zeppelin and the Ramones, but also like, uh, you know, uh, Credence and like he loved all, so much stuff, you know, he was a really deep yep. fan of music. And he said people, I always remember him saying to me on the phone once, people, they focus on this one thing uh, that, that I could do, which is the... <laughs> You know, I mean, that there's a lot of people just focus on that and they hone in on that and they want me to do that over and over. But that's just one very, very small aspect of what I'm interested in doing and, and what I think I'm capable of. And so I think he uh, he battled it a little bit. But man, did he ever, you know, um, it, was, it was just the most frustrating thing about him passing away, to be honest, just purely speaking on a creative level was that. And I thought about this a lot before he passed away. I thought, God, he's in a good place right now. Like with the fact that he'd just done a few months previous to him passing the audio sleeve uh, reunion gig. Uh, he had, you know, the Higher Truth album out. He had an, uh, another one in the can. Uh, he was working on a new Soundgarden record. He was doing soundtrack for the Machine Gun Preacher movie. He had that, uh, that song called The Keeper. Um, he had his hands, I mean, he could go out and tour and he could sell out Royal Albert Hall playing solo or with one he used to tour with a, a you know, a cellist and he, so it was just to, you know, the, the, it was, he was in this amazing place. He'd go do Audio Slave, Soundgarden, solo, play acoustic, play electric, all these different styles in here. So that was what was so frustrating is he did get to that place where he had that freedom, yeah. that he had that freedom where maybe he was battling with what Michael was talking about and relating to you. He got there eventually where it was like, man, all these doors were just wide open. What a career, like, to, so. Chris, what, for, for you, now you work with Brian Ferry. I mm. mean, to me, like, Roxy Music um, as a child, I, I actually, I, I think the big one was like, I dated this girl who was eight years older than me when I was a teenager. <laughs> so, <laughs> so she, she, she was like, you know, like a, child of the 70s while I was more of a child of the late 70s early 80s is where I sort of started listening to music so she was playing me like pajama rama and 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 stuff like that and I remember being like 
what is this music? And I got to hear like, because the, the the mainstream Roxy music that I knew of it was like Avalon and Brian Brian Ferry crooner style kind of right, solo right. jealous guy cover all of that kind of period. That's that's the stuff that sort of I grew up with him. But mm. then you go back and like Roxy music was like this insane art rock band, you know. And I know, man. The first, I mean, the first track of the first uh, thing they put out, you know, which I believe was remake remodel, which is just like. You know, it's it's just it's this wild jam with uh, just crazy sounds and just uh, my just about my my only when I was you know uh, out touring with him for for years and years like the the the, the only uh, sort of real I mean there's a few phrases that you had to play but really it was just like jam in in F minor <laughs> uh, here we go one two three jam and then you just like rock out art rock style in uh, for for about four minutes you know with you know there were there were obviously things in there but it was an utter jam kind of scenario it was so freaking edgy the music that they put out in you know in, in that first uh like well decade of Brian Ferry making music it was uh it was hella edgy and uh, and very arty and uh yeah, I have a, a ton of respect for it educate me a little bit like because i'm most familiar with avalon and and that and that era of course you know but like was it um did he did he have like big hits or or hits from that era like when they were first out from the from that first era uh, that first decade i or? think what i think one of the first ones was uh virginia plain yeah, it was huge. Uh, which, uh, which, if you if you haven't seen the, there's a, a few funny videos. Uh, one, I think, when they did one of the big shows in uh, in in Britain that they did a they, they did a TV thing, and it's out on YouTube. If you look up uh, Virginia Plain, it's hilarious. And uh, uh, you know, Br- Br- oh, you Brian, know Br- Brian Eno been... uh, is there, and uh, they're if, just, I to, they're, if I was to guess, I'd say yeah. Old Grey Whistle Test. Was it the Old Grey Whistle Test? Oh, that, that may have been it. Yeah. Okay, yeah, I'm gonna make a note it. to check this out. Um, it's uh, it's pretty funny, and it says something about like how kind of wild and irreverent and uh, and just like downright creative uh, they were at that time. Um, yeah, it was, it was it's it's pretty rocking. And and Ferry, everything about Brian Ferry and the whole band. I mean, yes, for instance, you got you got Brian Eno in it, and and just mm. like how insane is that? You know, one of the greatest musical minds. Um, mm. But then you go back and you see. You know, Brian Ferry was sort of, I, I wouldn't want to directly compare him with Bowie because Bowie's like in this sort of like status, you know, which which is pretty hard, pretty untouchable status. But he has that same appeal to me because he was like there with like this crazy kind of short haircut where everybody else was like super long haired hippies. He wore this skin tight tailored suit and he just had this kind of like gentleman of rock kind of thing in the early 70s yeah he, he just had his own style you know um ferry yeah F- ferry's very underestimated as successful as like that period they had with avalon which obviously was multi-million selling worldwide smash as successful as they were i still don't think brian ferry is recognized for being the talent that he really is you know um yeah he crosses well, he, he was, so he- many yeah, he, he was so commercially successful in the eighties and stuff like that, and you know they played Live Aid and and all that all of that stuff. But really, I think the biggest influence that they had uh, on the music business on on musicians and artists, uh, I think, was uh, you know that foundation was laid in the seventies with uh, with just how different and how wild they were. The same way that that Bowie, you know, had um, his kind of you know thing where people were just like, what is that and then you know they obviously fell in love with it and and then started to adapt certain things from that and build more upon that so i think you know the 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 the, the, the reason that they are as, as influent as influential as as they have uh, they seem to have been you know was uh, was was probably that was probably because of a lot of the stuff they did in the 70s you know to be fair the the big hit that you probably know would know pete is love is the drug okay oh yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Dum, 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 you know, yeah, that love is a drug, and I, I can't. Did you used to play that live? I presume every night. Uh, about one thousand <laughs> times. Yeah. <laughs> Going back to the conversation that we uh, that we were talking about before about pleasing people, you know, I saw that for through through many years of touring with him, how he, you know, because he's he's really an artist and likes to repre- express himself his way as well, but he also understands that obviously people expect to hear certain tunes and and that's always something you know that you have to to weigh up but like first like a, a song like love is a drug i think i probably 
I may not have done any gigs with him without us playing that song. You know, it's like it's one of those songs that he bo- he likes it and he knows that everybody knows it. Yeah, Pajama Rama, Virginia playing. Da, 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 I mean, the tension in that track is absolutely amazing. Yeah, Roxy Music. Um, how long did you tour with him for? Uh, four years. Four years. Yeah, yeah. that's. And he, you know, he was keep he was keeping really busy during that time as well. So it's it was uh, it was a, it was a good uh, kind of formative time. Uh, I, I learned a lot, and and also you know he surrounds himself with with some pretty great uh, musicians. You know, so I I got to know a few uh, people that are that have become friends, and and also have you know um, just open up some some doors to to certain things. And you know, who, who's, awesome. who else was in the band? Uh, well, the, the, the last in, I went through three different, uh, three main kind of, uh, incarnations of the band. It changed uh, three times while I was, while I was doing it. Um, but the last one had Neil Jason, uh, on the bass, which he became a really good friend of mine, which I don't know if you know him, but, um, uh, I mean, from a jazz perspective, he played on uh, heavy metal bebop, the Brecker brothers. So he, he goes nice. way back, way back and played with the Brecker brothers. Uh, and, uh, but aside from that, you know, he's just that uh, he, he, uh, played on, well, a bunch of, uh, of Brian's solo albums, uh, back in the eighties, but also just like on, uh, I mean, I, I, I'm thinking like Lee Sklar kind of level of, uh, of like Where's amount of, uh, tunes. Uh, it, so what's that? Where's he from? Where does he live? Is he, is he, he a New York guy? He's a, yeah, he's in uh, New York, New, New Jersey. Yeah, did New he York. play on Imagine, John Lennon? Is that right? Is he the bass it's player? Possible. Neil? Actually, it's possible. It's possible, yeah. He played on a bunch of like, like he, for example, he played on, um, uh, what's it, Brothers in Arms, uh, Dire Straits. Uh, like, I he, think he, I jammed you know, the, with him once. I think I did a gig with him at the, the Iridium with the strangely it's like a, uh, it was a really crazy band i wonder if i think he's the bass player i'm thinking of but anyway it's sure. it's very possible yeah he's he's he he's done so much stuff and some of it is like scarily big time like you know albums that al- albums that you grew up with uh from for me like brothers in arms for example uh you know uh money for nothing and all that sort of stuff you know the, um but uh but no he he, he played with, um what's the one girls just want to have fun what's that girl oh, cindy um, lopper Cindy Lauper, yeah, he, he played on all of her stuff. Yeah, I think that's just, that's the bass player. I did this gig at the Iridium, like we did two or three nights there, and it was such a crazy band. It was uh, Anton Fig. Oh, that's yeah, that's one of his real good friends. Yeah, oh, there you go. I think that's yeah. it then, because he Anton probably got him in as uh, yeah, and uh, and Steve Stevens and Sebastian Bach singing from Skid Row, oh, <laughs> and we did wow. all this like Aerosmith and Van Halen and all this kind of stuff. Wow. It was crazy, yeah. And and what else did we play? God, I can't remember. I mean, I remember doing Seasons of Wither by Aerosmith, and uh, wow, and yeah, there's videos <laughs> of it on on YouTube, and it was really fun. And I always remember standing out front with Anton because the the Ed Sullivan theaters across the street, basically. And I, and I pointed over there and I said, cause you know, of course he was the Letterman show forever. And I said, how long did you work over there? And I was pointing across the street and he goes, where you mean at McDonald's? Cause there was a McDonald's next door. <laughs> <laughs> right next to the Ed Sullivan Theater. I, was just, I just I always remember that. It was funny. He was a funny guy. Anton, he was cool. And Pete, actually, that does remind me that uh, Neil just uh, sent me a pedal. He, uh, uh, he, he was working with his company to make a, a, a bass pedal that he um, um, debuted at NAMM. And uh, in typical Neil style, he decided to buy the company and uh, now owns the company and... Um, and uh, it's putting out this pedal and, and we'll also put out other pedals. But uh, cool. actually, that would be a, a, um, a fun pedal to try out. It's, it's kind of like an envelope filter type vibe. So not your average kind of a, a pedal, but I'd love to uh, to lend it to you if you want to give it a, a run. I'd love to try it. Yeah, I love good envelope right. followers. It's funny, my buddy Kurt Biscara, who everybody knows is a great drummer, uh, Fantastic. He loves playing bass too. And he, he oh, actually, he does? yeah, and he's hooked up with this West Co pedal company and made an envelope follower with them. So he's got a signature envelope follower pedal, and everybody knows him as a drummer. But it's great, and it's called the Grease Juicer. And they make a guitar and a bass version optimized for the, and it is a funky, oh, it's a fuzz. You know what it does is it's actually the, nice. now that I think, I'm remembering the pedal because it's been a minute since I did it, but it's a, it's a fuzz and an envelope follower that, that uh, replicates the whole Bootsy thing. 
uh, where he used to use an envelope follower and a fuzz, but with like a mixer pedal so that you could use them both together and the envelope follower wouldn't get, you know, collapsed by the fuzz and stuff like that. But it's in a pedal. Anyways, I'm starting to do more bass pedals. I got to show you. I got this thing from Atomic recently, which is this company that makes cool modeling stuff. And uh, this is a, it's called the Bass Box. And I'm, I'm excited to try it because I think it's kind of got a, you know, DI mixed with ampy distortion thing going on, that kind of thing in a pedal. And they, they do nice stuff. So I'm, a, awesome. I'm, I'm, not a, I'm not a great bass player. I consider myself a hobbyist bass player, but sometimes I invite bass player friends over to make bass videos and stuff. It's fun. <laughs> or, or I'll do it myself. But yeah, I love, I have secretly, I just want to be a bass player. I just want to get, because, you know, you make the same money as all the other guys touring in the band. And, like, <laughs> and you have a P bass and an SVT and a cable, maybe a tuner. <laughs> That's it. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I, I, I actually, yeah, I actually on. did that. My one of my first like quote unquote successes was there. I was I was this guitar player learning how to like shred and everything, and then I got um, a friend of mine, um, Patch Patrick Hannon, who was the drummer in the Sundays, starts this new band with this American girl singer and says to me, "Oh, we need a bass player. Do you want to come and audition?" So I came. I learned the stuff, and all, the whole all the songs were like exactly what you'd expect. <laughs> And that was me spending all my time at home going, blah, 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 blah. And, and I auditioned and I got the gig and then we did a song and then it charted and I'm like, wait there, I'm a bass player now <laughs> playing root notes, you know, and, and I remember exactly the same thing. The, one of the first gigs we ever did, I think it may have been the second gig we ever did was at the Mean Fiddler. Did you play the Mean Fiddler, Quist? Uh, I believe I have like a, like a long time ago. Yeah, it's in London, in Halston, in London, for those, those that don't know the venue. It's a really famous old venue. So we play the Mean Fiddler, and I was dating this uh, this American girl, actually, before I moved to America. This is 20-plus years ago. And I'm playing bass, and we have a guitar player, and Patch is playing drums, and a girl singer also plays guitar. And after the show, because I... Because it was great. It was liberating. I'm playing bass. So I'm like <laughs> jumping all over the place. I don't have any pedals to worry about. And I'm just, woo. And I'm playing root notes and I'm just digging it. And the poor old guitar player is like 50 pedals, you know, playing slide, picking, corner <laughs> work, you know, yep. like working overtime. So he's like standing there, staring down the whole time, trying to play all these parts and get all these pedals. So after the show, the girl I was dating at the time comes up to me and goes, oh, I really enjoyed that. You you look so great on stage. You know, it's really, really good. The other guitar player just stands there looking bored. You should just get rid of him. Because <laughs> in her mind... Everybody was just playing guitar. You don't need this guy. I'm like, no, 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 I'm just playing bass. He's like, he's doing all the clever stuff. And she's like, yeah, but it doesn't look very good. You should just get rid of him. There you go. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> and you're like, and yeah, so and then Glenn, the money gets doled out at the end of the gig and you get paid the same. <laughs> exactly. Like, Wait, so Glenn Fricker, Glenn Fricker, listen to this when he's going on about bass players. You got it wrong. It's the best gig. <laughs> that is funny. Hey, that, uh, that, that, um, that leads me to want to ask a question. Uh, going back to like uh, artistic uh, authenticity and stuff like that uh, or, uh, and being yourself uh, as an artist. Pete, ha have you ever... How, how much thought have you ever given to how you appear on stage? Because um, oh. that, you know, because because as somebody who fits into a multitude of contexts, yeah, you know, it's it, it's something that uh, is is relevant relevant whether we like it or not. If I look back at the outfits I've worn over the years, I was sometimes <laughs> I was more successful at certain times than others. I would say, but you know, it's funny because it, with every gig, it's a good it's a good discussion because pe people out there that. They, they should know that it's like sometimes it's a big deal and sometimes it's it's up to the artist and they're like you know i mean when i um you know actually i don't want to name names but it's like certain people will be like uh they're, they're you know they they pick out the outfits basically and and what they want you to wear i mean mm -hmm. i've had to i've had to come to think of it i mean one of the i can name like the, the milan farmer gig is a french big french pop star she's like the madonna of france or something and i i did a, a, her gig and it's it's very much a pop gig and the band is kind of in the back and there's dancers on stage in the front and stuff like that but it's i mean she's it's like you know arenas or stadiums it's a huge thing 
and every detail is very thought out, including the out, the outfits, which were Gautier did the, uh, uh, the the outfits for the one tour I did. But it was cra- I kind of looked like a waiter on that tour, where I had on like a uh, <laughs> it looked like like long socks and a kind of like apron like thing, and then a, a, a you know black shirt with a black tie and stuff like that. And it, but I was told, oh, you guys got lucky on this tour because the previous one before that was like uh, they were dressed kind of like priests, but armless shirts priest collars and backless oh my goodness <laughs> you know and that's what she wants so it's like and and it's like well you you already signed the contract and it's great money and it's like you're in france for the next six months so you, let me just put on that backless shirt and just do what? <laughs> <laughs> this is part of what we do you know uh, that's, that's yeah. a pretty extreme example and it but, looks great to the audience the audience yeah. love it yeah yeah it's like this is part of the gig you know and then there's other yeah. things of course where people are like i don't care man we're we're whatever you want on stage so it's it's the runs the gamut that's what i've discovered you know yeah, 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 yeah. So if you're watching and you want to hire Pete, you can put him in a diaper. He's happy. Yeah, I'm pretty much a, I'm, I'm pretty much a whore. You can just give him, just, just, just pay as long. Don't bounce my check, and we're good. <laughs> but the, 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 the other side of it is uh, oh, the other side of it is obviously like like what I was thinking of uh, as well was like moves and stuff like that. Rather, you know how you appear in terms of moves, and you know uh, n- not just what you're wearing, like because. Moves, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I I remember people talking about like you should practice in front of a mirror and stuff like that. I mean, have you guys ever done any of that? Yeah, I have. I mean, I, actually, I recommend quite often that people. Um, I did a video on auditioning that's on my channel if anybody wants to check it out. But one yeah. of the, one of the things I make a point about is um, don't make the first time that you play standing up as though you were performing, which is probably going to be on an audition for a gig. You know, or you know what I mean? Or maybe you're maybe you've got a gig and you're going in to do it with an artist or something and it's a TV show or something, don't make the very first time you play that song be the performance or the audition where you're standing up playing, trying to look natural. Yes. In other words, you know, sitting at home playing with the guitar in a chair and under a perfect circumstance is one thing. Standing up, maybe having to sing background vocals through a PA uh, or on in-ears, you know? You know, it, that can be like the very first time you ever play with the in-ears in is the, no, no, you know, you want to you wanna, uh, practice as much as possible, I would say, simulate the situation that you're going to be in. So, uh, and, and you know, get those parts down, right? You know, the guitar feels different on a strap hanging, standing up uh, than it does sitting down and playing with an imperfect position. You might go, oh God, this part's actually kind of hard to play standing up. So I like to practice like that. And I've gone as far as to actually sometimes before a big audition or something that I really care about, rent a rehearsal studio or something with a PA, play the tracks through the PA, play my rig loud, sing, and stand for up. yourself yeah. like uh, just yourself yeah. man that's devotion that's awesome i've actually done that and, and, and you know yeah. and, and it's also uh yeah i mean it just makes you more comfortable when you get to that moment where you're ready you know totally yeah yeah so no doubt about it yeah. um and and then when it comes to the same thing with the the you know some certain artists want to have some control or maybe total control over what you're wearing and then other ones don't care i've had certain artists that are like uh, yeah, listen, roam the stage. It's yours. Go for it. Go crazy. And then other people are like, you know, where it's the thing like, hey, you're, you know, maybe you're on a riser in the back or maybe it's like, don't. I remember Melissa Etheridge saying once and she paid me like a big compliment because she said you he all and she said this in interviews too, like where he says he knows when to stand up and take the spotlight. And then he always knows when it's time to step back. Like, uh, which is like a read the room kind of thing on stage. Like, so a lot of improvising going on in Melissa Etheridge's band is very jammy. And it's like, so when she gives you, and it could be a different, like maybe on a song where you've never taken a solo, she might look at you and nod and go for it, you know, like play something here. So then you got to walk up and rise to that occasion and play. And then you got to know when it's time to wind, wind it up <laughs> and back up, you know? And, and yeah. that's like this weird thing and intangible almost that it's like, you know, don't overstep your bounds. I've heard of people getting in trouble in gigs before where it's like, you know, the artist is the star and the side man's kind of up at the front of the stage and, you know, doing their thing and stuff. And then afterwards, it's like, hey, you need to tone it down a little bit. Like, you know, remember, who, you know, and it's, it's generally not the artist is going to tell you that. It'll be like the, <laughs> the road manager comes to you and says, you need to stay, <laughs> right? They get the I, message. I did goes so down. much. I did so much tweaking of that with uh, Brian Ferry. When I first started, the, the first tour we did, I have some very specific memories actually uh in America it was a tour of America and uh I remember coming the when it, when the tour got to um to Las Vegas and they they 
we, we were toying with how much I should be doing exactly what you were saying, like stepping up and going to the very front, you know, foot on monitor, like, here I am type thing. And they just, they were like, oh, we, you can do more, you, you know, you can, and they kept pushing it. And in, uh, in Las Vegas, I finally got to a point where they, after that gig said, okay, that, w- that was it, but now tone it down 20%. Uh, <laughs> like, uh, interesting. Like, I remember that they were like, okay, great. You got to the, you got to where we were hoping, but now take it down a tiny bit. I was like, oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, but, but yeah, with, with him, you know, it was, uh, they, they, you know, they, they, they care a lot about how, how, how you act. And, and also, I don't know if you guys know the, the famous quote, uh, uh, that the Roxy music said, uh, you know, like, uh, other bands at the time were like, uh, uh, wrecking everybody's uh, hotel rooms and stuff. Well, they they went in there and wanted to redecorate them. <laughs> right. that, that, that was like that's this famous quote for Roxy. They went in there and like to redecorate the, the all the hotel rooms rather than like wreck them. And that says something about how much we. I was like you know like we had a freaking stylist for the band. That right, was right. Like you had to get checked. You know, bef- like you know, like literally. And if we were wearing something new, they'd come in, take a picture, and take it to the the boss man to see that we could get approval. I've, uh, I've done gigs same stations. thing. I like that though. I mean, that's what I want from a Brian Ferry tour is I want that kind of detail. Yeah, no, I mean, if anybody can do it, he's like, you know, yeah, you can expect it in that kind of situation. I, I think Morrissey's camp is a lot like that too. Oh yeah. Well, he goes all the way as the, the food as well, man. I, Cause I, I, some of the crew with Brian Ferry has worked with, uh, with Morrissey and they were like, if there is any meat in the kitchen, for any of the cater, you know, any catering has any meat for any person of the personnel. Yeah. He's like, no gig. I'm not having okay, it. Okay. Okay. I got to tell a great story. This is awesome. So do, does anybody know Chris Pooley? Do you, do you know him? Yeah. You know, yeah. Okay. So, I, I've come, a, yeah, come great, across him. Great guy. And he's MD, does American Idol now and stuff. And he uh, played in Smashing Pumpkins. And But one, one of his touring gigs uh, was, uh, was, was Morrissey. And he tells this great story exactly about what you were just saying, where if Morrissey so much as gets a, a whiff of meat anywhere on stage or the, the gig is done. So they were on stage and they were playing and evidently there was a vendor out in the crowd somewhere that was selling meat and cooking or something like that. And Morrissey got a whiff. And so anyway, Chris Pooley, it's a festival. I got to act this out. He's off it to the side of the stage and he's getting his accordion on for the next song because he's a keyboard player. So he's getting his accordion <laughs> on and he's got the accordion. He's getting ready to go and stuff. And meanwhile, this whole meat thing has happened and, and everybody, Morrissey just drops the mic and walks off, you know, <laughs> and everybody follows suit. And Pooley has got his accordion and he's ready to play the next song. And he says, he comes walking on stage and he's got the accordion and he just kind of goes all the way across the stage with the accordion and exits. <laughs> Exit stage left. <laughs> yeah. Everybody walked <laughs> off, and then the last thing everybody sees, who's all, you can imagine they're all disappointed, going, what the hell's going on? Like, he's, he's bailing, you know? And then you see a guy with a accordion just go all the way across <laughs> the stage. Yeah. <laughs> Amazing. I think we're all saying the same thing. You know, we've all worked with, you guys obviously, uh, with live artists, huge tours, to working with some of the biggest people in the world. For me, when it comes to recording, it's like, yes, it's the same principle. It's like that guy, girl, band, whatever it is, is they are your bosses. They are paying your bills. It doesn't matter if I'm even producing a big artist. The reality is, it's like, they're still my boss. They still, it doesn't matter if it's EMI, Sony, Merck, I don't care who's writing the check. If they make that phone call and says, Warren is no longer on the gig, Warren is no longer on the gig. It's just the way it is. And if they want whatever it might be, they, they want to dictate these the terms so they are comfortable and they're able to perform. That is their prerogative. And it's it's an interesting thing, isn't it? Because that's something that's not really talked about. Because when you're a fan, you know, you read about some of these things that artists, you know, the famous ones like the brown M&Ms. Because we all, you, we all know why Van Halen did that. Because they wanted to make sure that there was attention to detail. And the tour manager basically said at the time, is like, if they got in there and they hadn't done that then they would be concerned about all of the big deal stuff like is the pa the way it's supposed to be is the security good do these guys know how to run a huge arena if they can't even do a simple task like removes some brown m&ms from a couple of packets of m&ms it was their sort of tester and they would go in if the rider was perfect and all the details were taken care of the whole band would feel like yeah this venue 
They know what's going on. It's silly things like that. Francis Dunnery, Frank Dunnery, he said that after touring, he figured out that the rider was the great opportunity to like do the things that you'd always forget. So his rider was fresh pair of socks and fresh pair of Calvin Klein underwear. He said, because he'd always forget to pack it, he'd turn up at the show, play, you know, a big sweaty show for two hours. There'd usually be, a, a you know, some kind of shower in those, a big venue like that. Go and have a shower and he could always put on a fresh pair of underwear and a fresh pair of socks. So my question is, for riders, what did you guys have? What was in your rider? Ah. Uh. You want to go first? <laughs> no, you go. Uh, I think that that's actually great. Uh, like, you know, toothbrush, toothpaste, socks, underwear is great stuff to actually have on a rider. Because um, generally there's a lot of, you know, BS that ends up on there that you don't end up eating and stuff. There's the deli tray that nobody touches or the, you know, things like that. So, so real practical things is good. But it's funny because I've done tours with, at this point, that's everything from full catering with, uh, you know, like just going beyond the rider. I mean, like like Melissa, for example, because she went through cancer, she she had a terrific chef. So we would, we, you know, it was a theater gig. It wasn't, you know, we, it wasn't like stadiums or something we we're playing, but we had this catering that was like outstanding where it was just like every day, breakfast, lunch, dinner was just killing. So that was awesome. But I've done everything from that to no rider. And I, do, and I mean, like, you're sourcing your own water and stuff. <laughs> Same. <laughs> like, backstage. Yeah. So, you never know. Like, because once again, as a side man, they might ask you, like, hey, is there anything you want on the rider? You know, anything you want to add? And you can pick a couple things, you know. But you're not the artist. So, it's like, you know, uh, you, you, you kind of take what you can get and stuff. So, you know, you know, the great thing to always keep in mind, I think, once you get into this game, if you do and you're lucky enough to get a gig and stuff, and then maybe you're ready to move on to the next gig, just... Don't think that that next gig is going to resemble the previous one you had. It might be better in some ways, and it's probably going to be worse in some ways. And no two are the same. You know, that's it. Like everything from the travel to the way you get paid to the, you know, whether or not somebody's dressing you to go on stage to the, you know, the you might have your own dressing room sometimes, or it might be everybody's crowded in one. You know, everything changes uh, from gig to gig to gig. And that ability to adapt to maybe no rider or to whatever is 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 uh, crucial i think you know yeah I, i'm nodding to the <laughs> to, to, to the general point here you know because uh, yeah it's uh it can be very you can you can be at a, at a gig for various reasons you know and uh sometimes the uh sometimes the music is great but but the uh the circumstances are less so you know and uh and so on, you know, so you got to be flexible if, uh, and, and you don't, you know, you're not always going to, you know, have your bottle of uh, whiskey like I have on my rider. <laughs> <laughs> you, have, you have a bottle of whiskey on your rider? <laughs> I'm just kidding. But no, yeah, I mean, oh, well, like, uh, you know, with, sort well, with, of Brian, just kidding. With, with Brian, we had a, you know, a, a band rider. So it wasn't like, I mean, you could have, everybody could have like personal requests and get that in there. But really it was a democracy between the band to choose the items for the rider. Uh, so you could get, you know, you could get stuff in, but you'd have to uh, participate in the democratic uh process uh to get it in there but yeah no like whiskey is something that uh, i enjoy having um on a rider but uh, you know it's it's socks are probably a better choice general generally you, you, you <laughs> said the music could be great but something else might not you might you reminded me of my mantra which is which is th there's the three great things on the gig that you got to take into account the music the money and the hang and i always say that any two of those is enough to really enjoy a gig. If the music's great and the money's great, but the hang's not so good, like, you know, you don't get along with the people that well, it's like, yeah, but we're playing these great tunes and we can just talk. I mean, that's most great bands in the world these days, right? Just tolerating one another because they're out there for the great <laughs> paycheck and because the music's <laughs> badass, right? Okay, yeah, or yeah. you could have a great hang and the music's awesome, but the money's kind of a drag. It's like, oh God, this gig doesn't pay very well, but we're playing great tunes and I'm with my friends. But if you've only got one, the money's mm -hmm. great and the music sucks and the hang's not good. That ain't enough. You know, it doesn't matter how good the money is, you're going to be miserable. And if you got all three, about, you're styling. Then you got a great gig. <laughs> what, what, what about <laughs> if it's like a, a 1.5? <laughs> you know, the money's good and the music's mainly good. Yeah. You <laughs> probably last a little while. Sort of okay. <laughs> You'll probably last or, a little while. 
Or like, or like two people in the band you can't get on with at all and two people are like your best friends. I've made so many records where it's like you got, you know, two prima donnas and two just of the most humble, easy to get on, which is usually obviously the rhythm section. <laughs> Let's be honest. <laughs> right, like the right, bass right. player and the drummer, you got the gig and the bass player and drummer are just the sweetest guys and you're just like, I love these guys. And then the singer and the, uh, whoever the writers are, the singer and the, co the co-writing guitar player or keyboard player are like at World War Three, and you're just hanging out with the rhythm section. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess it's all just, uh, uh, it's, it's perspective and reality, isn't it? No situation's perfect. You, you must be such, you must be such a pro war now at like reading dynamics like that uh, in uh, working situations. Uh, well, that I, I think, yes, definitely acquired knowledge. I think it's one of the biggest parts of our, our mutual jobs is mm. people skills. Definitely. Um, it's um, it's different. I, I have I have learned, and I, I get this feeling from you you guys as well. I've learned that I have to be the same person all the time. There was this when you're young, you get very naive, and you think that you have to show people different sets of different kinds of deference. They're like, oh, this person's famous. I have to be, you know, all submissive and whatever you need. And this person, yeah, they're younger, so I can be more tough. No, I'm the same person. I, I think one of the biggest lessons I learned was was as an engineer um, working with uh, guys like Jack Douglas. And, I, and the, the thing about Jack Douglas is he's not the producer that sits there and like he can, but he's not the guy that sits there and like rewrites every single part and dictates and brings out sheet music and all this kind of, I mean, if he wanted to, I know he has all those levels of talent. He's done things from writing hit songs to everything, you know, or everything. So I know he can do that. His skill is the fact that everybody in the room feels important. He doesn't make the bass player or the drummer feel any less important than the world famous lead guitar player or lead singer. Everybody's ideas are welcome. And he always creates a wonderful environment. And I remember we were in Boston with Aerosmith for three months and then we come back to LA and we're like six, nine months here. I can't remember, six months and my, my big studio and then three months in this small studio here, mixing, doing overdubs and vocals and all that stuff. And I remember about halfway through the process, I suddenly dawned on me, Steven Tyler was working at uh, American Idol from like 10 a.m. till 7 p.m. every day. He would Sorry, no, it was like 12 till 7. And sometimes he'd show up at the studio at 10 a.m. and want to work for an hour or two before running to American Idol. They need to work in American Idol all day, have to be on the whole day. Yeah, you know, be all on and like on it the whole time. Then he'd come back to the studio. He'd eat the catering at American Idol, wouldn't go for dinner. He'd come to the studio half an hour afterwards. He'd be in the studio working sometimes till two o'clock in the morning and then come back in at 10 a.m. And he did this for six days a week while he was filming American Idol, while he was doing, he'd go for rehearsals, he'd be on. And so he was doing these like 18 hour days and he was probably 62, 63, 64, something like that. And I remember I'm, I'm watching this happen for two or three weeks. And then I was like, Shit. He came in at 10 a.m. and sang, and he was singing at 1 a.m. the night before. And so it's like 11.30, he's just about to leave. You know, he's just finishing up his last, last vocal take. And I just sort of leaned in on the talk back, and this is what I learned from being with Jack, and said, that was really good. You did, a, you did great work. And last night, those vocals, the comp sounded fantastic. And he just had this big grin and said, thanks, man, and left. And I just dawned on me. The guy's like the, one of the most famous rock singers in the world. And nobody ever says to him genuinely that you did a good job because it's all like, well, he's untouchable. He's a genius. I don't need to flatter his ego. No, he's a freaking human being, just like all us three. A crew member comes up to you, has seen every single guitar player ever work with either, you know, with either Brian Ferry or Chris Cornell and comes up to you and says, wow, what a great set. I bet you it means more than anything else because you know that that guy who's like taking care of drums for, you know, for that band for the last 10 years, just noticed that you did something great. It means something. And I think that that's what we forget that, you know, that's one of the biggest takeaways from working with somebody like Jack Douglas for me is the fact that I realized that we're all human beings. None of us, even though some of us are self-appointed, none of us are actually experts. We're learning every single day. We flying by the seat of our pants, making it up as we go, hoping for the best. You know what I mean? You know, you, um, you make an interesting point because you, you, you started off your point by saying that you don't treat uh, the 
the rock stars yep. and the and then maybe the you know a hired you know a, a crew member or, or a musician that's hired or something any different. Um, yep. And a lot of people might take that as to mean like, oh, well, I'm not going to give the rock stars this preferential treatment. But you actually kind of no. turned it around and said, like, yep. I like to, uh, which I, f I find really, uh, really a cool thing. I mean, th you know, the fact that you would, they need praise and to know when they did a good job as well. Uh, they're not this untouchable, like, oh, they just know that yep. they're, you know, that, so that's, that's really great. It's great to a point to remember that. You know, and that's part happens, of being human. And then what too. happens is when you do give them advice, they believe you. Because if you're running around going, oh, you're a god of everything. I, I, I was blessed uh, years ago um, to meet Jeff Beck, and I went over to his house and hung out with him and jammed. It was like one of my biggest experiences in my life. And, and it was in 99, 2000. So it was at a period where I was in bands and I was coming out the other side, and I didn't know whether I was going to stay in music. I was young enough to go... I was thinking about going back to law school and getting a degree and becoming a lawyer. And that, you know, I, I always wanted, I was thinking of doing that. And then I'm thinking to myself, do I want to do that or do I want to stay in music? I want a good life. I want to provide for a family. You know, I wasn't married at the time, but you know what I mean? I wanted a good life. So I either had to up my game in music or I had to, um, you know, I, I, I had to just change direction and, and go and do something at a higher level, um, you know, educate myself more to, get, to make more money that way. And I met Jeff Beck, and I just walked away. All the stereotypes were gone. Every idea I'd had about ego and everything. He was just a guy and hanging out, and we were swapping riffs. And yes, he's arguably the greatest guitar player in the world, you know. But I still walked out of it going, wow, that was so amazing. And he talked to me like a regular human being, and I was, I felt relaxed. I didn't feel like I had to be like, oh my God, you're amazing. You know, even though obviously he, he is and I feel that way. It's, it's those kind of experiences where you get to meet truly amazing people and you see the humility in them and then it teaches you how to treat people because how else would I know? Like, unless you lead, meet a, a leader in our field and see just how humble and normal they are, you don't really you know, you know what I mean and it broke down all the stereotypes because I'd heard all these things you know they read all these stories from as a kid that like Jeff Beck was like this massive like you know you know terrible uh, terrible kind of leader and stuff and no I kind of got the opposite and then I started looking at it from a perspective like Frank Zappa Jeff Beck Miles Davis um you know these guys that if you were in a, their bands you went on to do great things because they chose the best players, they had the best arrangements. You, you know what I mean? I, there's Meralda Nike, Michael Walden, like a teenager, early 20s, playing drums on Wired, went off to be one of the biggest, if not top 10 producers in the 80s, and songwriter, Whitney Houston, all of this stuff, he was producing all those tracks. You know, and, and you see like how really great people that we get to work with can empower us and lift oh, us yeah. up and focus us. Oh man, I find that. I mean, the personalities. Totally. I have a, a dual kind of because uh, I get I, I I find them addictive, kind of like because he's a g g sort of you know high functioning, really creative personality. Somebody like Stephen, uh, uh, like you were mentioning, you know, pretty fascinating guy to hang out with uh, and and see work on that level, and you know the amount of time. Like I find that addictive. You know, somebody that would work seventeen hours a day at at that stage, and I like to be around that energy and just kind of. Mm -hmm. And then at the same time. It's at this point in my life, um, I, I also, because there's, a, there's the, the flip side and there can be, I'm not saying him in particular, I'm just saying with, with, with many of these personalities, there's sort of the dark side of it. Uh, you know what I'm saying? Like, I mean, I, and I, and oh, I yeah. find it like yeah. the, the, as, I, as I'm getting older, that the kind of like that rock star on a pedestal um, personality and the, I, I, I'm sort of, I'm finding it a little bit, uh, I don't want to say tedious or something but it can be you know it's great to have that i mean it's the it's the skill of like what what you're touching on warren i think of like treating them as a human being on that same human level giving them praise where praise is due but also letting them know when it, and that's the skill of a record producer i mean letting them know honestly when you think something could be better or whatever then you can ride that line and kind of keep it on that good level because if you mm -hmm. maybe as a side man you play a more differential sort of role and and at times it can be um draining 
on your uh, like on your psyche. It can be a little. You know, there's a lot of narcissism and stuff out there in the world, right? And it can get. Yeah. It can get a little yeah. like be, be a little bit of an emotional vacuum where you feel like yourself getting drained with some of these personalities. You know, so it's like, and and um, so it's a, it's a balancing act. I think that's all. You know, is is to is to keep it real. And luckily, most of the people I've worked with, I felt like have been really wonderful. Um, in that way, uh, you know, even folks that might have a reputation for being, I've had some great I think most people, most people want to be treated like humans anyway, you know, even, you know, they don't want you to put them up on, and because the moment that you uh, treat them like with some kind of weird filter that is not the authentic you, yeah, that's, that, 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 that's, that's already like, like a, a bad, bad start, start for having like, like a meaningful interaction, interaction with anybody, anybody isn't I, it? So, so it's like, you know, the more that one is able to, to like, to, to just speak from human to human, uh, it, it usually produces a better result, even if somebody is super famous. Uh, but it's, it's so hard, you know, it's not always easy to just like completely uh, switch off all of the, oh my God, oh my God, this this person in your head, you know. Uh, uh, but but I find that in my experience anyway, the more, the better, the more I'm focused on being authentically me or, or like being, not being like, oh, this person is such and such and, oh, he's done this and he's done that or whatever, you know, the, the, the more I'm able to not think about that and just uh, th remember that it's a human to human interaction, the more meaningful everything becomes. I Absolutely. The little bit I was going to put in, that I was hesitant to put in, but I, I will say it now and we can decide whether to edit it out later, is that Jeff told me that he had done an album with Steve Lukather producing that has never come out. And I was like, wow, you know, Steve Lukather, personally one of my favorite guitar players, melodically one of the greatest guitar players that ever lived. And it's incredible. And I said, well, why won't it come out? And he goes, he's too much of a fan. I think that's another part of what we're doing is like, I think when you're trying to get artistic greatness, you know, and we can argue this about a lot of artists that were in famous bands, go solo and don't seem to ever reproduce you know, that thing again. And a lot of people discuss it's because yeah, they started be they start getting surrounded by sycophants who are just telling them everything they're doing is amazing. And so without without picking the obvious artists that have all gone solo, they never quite have that four guys, four people in a room arguing and fighting about every idea and making something great or the competition of two great songwriters in one band, you know, like one, one person comes with an idea and then you should change it and put my bridge in. No, you're, my idea is better. And, and, you know, all the obvious things like the Beatles, you know, all of these great bands. What's the, uh, the best Paul McCartney album of the last 25 years, do you think? Say since 2000. It's it's a tough one. I mean, like, I, do, I remember enjoying that Memory Almost Full album um, because it was oh, the yeah. first time I had come back to pay attention. Um, but the reality is, is like, I listen to some of the stuff because I'm, I'm probably exactly like you. I'm friends with Brian Ray, so I will listen to stuff because I love Brian Ray. I like him as a person. I like his guitar playing. And so I'll check out the stuff. But I, I haven't listened to it in the same way necessarily I would listen to, you know... Um, you know, Ram or, or, you know, I mean, you go back and you go back to, to some of the early solo stuff. Some of it is unfricking believable I mean, Band on the Run, I'm going to get people disagreeing with me, but Band on the Run could be a Beatles album. You throw in about three or four John Lennon songs in that, and that's one it's of amazing. the best Beatles albums ever. Well, for me, I was going to say Chaos and Creation in the Backyard, which came out in 2003 or something like that, but it was... Who was I'm going to go back and check it out. Who was Radiohead's producer that did it with him? Yeah, Nigel Godridge. Nigel, right. Yeah, and, Godridge, yeah. And they allegedly really butted heads on a lot of stuff, and it's got some... I mean, that... Uh, uh, what was that song? Uh, uh, Jenny uh, Wren, I believe, uh, which is, like, as beautiful to me as yesterday. Uh, there's some there's some songs on that record that are just... Out out freaking standing like it's just like a, a really really great record but allegedly there was a lot of fighting going on and he didn't nigel didn't let him get away with like no you're gonna do that well first of all maybe you know it was probably difficult for the band but i think it, i believe nigel was kind of like you're gonna play everything on the record like kind of or as much as possible like i think he kind of because you i remember to get reading that, that. Yeah. yeah yeah and you know so there was this and and which he did you know and it's i don't, I don't know man i mean that record it, it really spoke to just the whole, like, yeah, occasionally it's a good thing to get in there and butt some heads and, like, have somebody tell you when, <laughs> you know, like, and not just be, because that's got to be a crazy difficult thing to do with somebody like Paul McCartney, you know, it's just like, mm. 
how do you do that? Yeah, it, t- it turns into the Chris Farley interview, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah I got exactly. Great. You, know, you remember when you were like uh, in the Beatles? Yeah, you know, it's like- <laughs> yeah, totally. Yeah, I think a tip I would say to any um, anybody that's working with. Um, Artists of any stature, you know, whether it comes down to being in the band or engineering or producing or mixing or anything. Um, The thing I've learned is to be a fan of what the band is a fan of. Because if you understand where they came from, you can really, really connect. Uh, I've heard that from, you know, like, like with Aerosmith, if you're a fan of the Yardbirds and Led Zeppelin, you're in because they love the Yardbirds. So when they're kids, they're hearing the Yardbirds for the first time going, I want to be in that. I want to be in that band. And that's why they put Aerosmith together because they wanted to be the Yardbirds. And Led Zeppelin is obviously that in-between band and she, obviously huge Led Zeppelin fans. Joe loves Jeff Beck's playing. He loves Jimmy Page's playing. You know, he's he may only be five or 10 years younger, but in that time when music was moving so rapidly, you know, a 1967 rock album to a 68, to a 69, to a 70. I mean, you, we all know the evolution was moving so fast. You had like, you know, John May on the Blues Breakers, kind of, you know, 65, 66, isn't it? And then you've got Cream the year later. Then you've got Hendrix at the same time. Then you've got the first albums by Jeff Beck or Truth. Oh, you know, all of this is like, then Sabbath coming out, you, you know what I mean? Deep Purple, first couple of Zeppelin albums, all in the space of like four years. Like, oh, mm-hmm. what a time. You make a yeah. you make an amazing point. I remember uh, talking to Kurt Biscara about getting the gig with uh, Mick Jagger. And he did the Wandering Spirit album around, this is 92 or something like that. And Mick did, did that. Really cool record, actually. Uh, but he's, he, it's a brilliant sort of strategy uh, for auditioning. As He was in the hallway listening to all the other drummers go in and play with Mick. And, of course, everybody's playing, you know, Honky Tonk or something or playing, you know, like doing a, I guess you'd get in there and Mick would be like, what song do you want to play, you know? And and they'd play. So he he's like, what can I do to make myself stand out? So he got in the room. And Mick's like, okay, so what are we going to do? What do you want to play? And he's like, let's play some James Brown. <laughs> oh, yeah. And Mick just lit up. And he yep. kicked off the groove. I don't know what song they played. You know, but he kicked off a groove and Mick starts dancing and stuff and sweating. And they just jam for 10 minutes on some James Brown. That's awesome. You got the gig. <laughs> be, a, be a fan of what they're a fan of. It was, yeah. Yeah. It, it makes, you want to know that, we all want to know, like, you know, we talked about doing this together doing these these kind of ideas and we're like we we all realize we're sort of cut from similar cloths and i think as you get older you know i don't know about you you guys you guys may have all been the most popular kids at school i certainly was and i was like bookish and quiet i grew into this personality i was like super shy really into art and music and all the things yeah, and music on a sort of different level, not just a haircut. You know, I would like go back and read the album covers. I'd cycle to my local right record shop and talk to the guy, shyly ask, you know, when the new album by whatever art. You know, I was that kind of kid. And, and so now we're adults and this is our playground. Yeah. So we get <laughs> to hang out, you know, like you, we might, might be that same kid in our school. So we're like one of 500 kids. And now... God bless the internet. We can all now be, we can join all those kids all over the world and we can all, that's what I love. This is our playground. So Mick Jagger, he probably was that same kid. He was probably listening to like blues, you know, of records that he was like beg, bollering and stealing and trying his hardest to get hold of. And so he found Keith Richards and he found all these other guys and they met and their mutual love. So yeah, you go into a room a guy gets up and plays something that he loves. It's like, here's another kid that I want in my playground. This is my playground, and I want to hang out with kids like me. Uh, you know. <laughs> yeah. That's well, awesome. Yeah. Definitely. Certainly seems like a lot more fun to, like, you know, uh, get pulled back into that moment that turned you on originally about music, you know, rather than have somebody come in that's going to kind of kiss your ass and, like, Try and impress you with like playing your songs that you've done as good as they can or whatever. You know, there's something about, some, yeah. you know, just like, oh, I feel like I'm 14 again all of a sudden with this guy playing drums, you know, and this is why I started. I remember, you know, it's brilliant. I remember doing some pre-production with a band and they, they were doing like these Chili Peppers grooves and they were cool, you know, sort of broken bass lines, you know, and, and Ick, Jack, Jung, Jagger, you know, and the kind of a straight Chad, but groovy kind of thing. And it was so 
they were young and um, you know relatively inexperienced, but it was so stiff. It was so you know, duh, 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 ding, ding, ding. And I and, and they're like, well, you know, we listened and they talked about Blood Sugar Sets Magic and they talked about all of these great albums. And I was like, that's cool. Go listen to the meters. You know, the, mm. the meters is where the Chili Peppers got that groove from. That's the reason why they covered meters songs. Yeah. They grew up listening to punk rock and funk. So go and listen to punk rock and funk and pull those two things together. Understand where it came from. Then you will sound like your heroes, the Chili Peppers. So this I, is the I thing think with, you know, uh, we could get into a whole like Greta Van Fleet discussion or bands like that, but where I, hmm. I did an article for Premier Guitar a while ago where I was talking about is rock eating itself, because if the, if the influence, you know, the pool of influence, you know, if you ask any young rock band that's trying to do a sort of throwback sound like that or something, it's like, what do you listen to? It's like, oh, Black Sabbath and Led Zeppelin or something, you know, and that's it. Well, what did Black Sabbath and Led Zeppelin listen to? I mean, it's like, yeah. you know, or the yeah. Beatles. I mean, you've got Paul's whole, you know, like vaudeville kind of thing going on. And then John obviously bringing in the dirty rock and roll and Elvis and everything else that, and putting all that together. And George with his like, you know, Indian music influences and stuff. And it's like, that's, that may, is what makes for really interesting you know, rock bands, I think, not just like, oh, well, we listen to Guns N' Roses, so now we're going to sort of be a band in that style. <laughs> you know? Yeah. It's like Sabbath had yeah, like, all kinds of interesting Yeah, influences. Charlie Gillett wrote a book called The Sound of the City, and he made that exact argument. He talked about, like, and, and there's obviously lots of bands that are exceptions to this, so I'm not trying to completely destroy a genre or whatever, but he talked about um, how rock music... Um, got too incestuous. He said that he he said exactly what you're talking about. He said like uh, the Yardbirds, John May on the Blues Breakers listened to blues, then the, and and Zeppelin, Jeff Beck solo, obviously Deep Purple, Black Sabbath, all listened to blues and the bands around them to create what we consider to be you know rock or heavy rock, and then. Aerosmith listened to those bands, but he said then Motley Crue listened to Aerosmith, and it, like there is the thing, exactly the same point that you, you made. Um, it's just it's become it's incestuous, you know. I I I can be a bit of a musical snob with this stuff. Sometimes I have kids working for me, and I'm like, do you know who Robert Johnson is? And if they don't, I'm like, go and find out who Robert Johnson is, because without Robert Johnson, there's no Rolling Stones. You know, how many covers of did they do of his? You know, Love in Vain, one of their biggest songs. You know, um. We think if I say cream to you now, best guitar solo, you probably all would say Crossroads, another Robert Johnson song. You know, yeah. it's like, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah, it's like it's in the blood, especially, you know, growing up in Britain. That was like, you know, it was in, in the blood of blues rock guitar players to know who Robert Johnson was, do covers and do. So it, I agree. It, you're making a massive point there. It's like it's get out of the incestuous idea and go back to to where it all came from. But Quist, I'm doing all the talking. I mean, what's, uh, firstly, where did you grow up? Because you, you, you have one of them accents. <laughs> <laughs> one of them accents. Uh, well, it's conf I'm confused because my wife is from Scotland and I lived in England for, uh, in London for a long, long time. So there's a little bit of that in there, but I was born in Denmark, in Copenhagen. But I mean, I, I actually grew, I grew up on blues and, and like, uh, and, and, and that sort of, you know, uh, both the halfway point and the whole, all the way back point, you know, uh, Robert Johnson and, and all that stuff, but also obviously the blues explosion and all that sort of stuff. Um, Clapton and, and all that stuff. That was the soundtrack to my, uh, to my upbringing. My dad was way into all that stuff. Brad Whitford has a couple of sons that play guitar and uh, they're both great guitar players. And the youngest one I remember at the time was a big fan. And this is, pretty funny considering his dad or interesting considering his dad's Brad Whitford was a big fan of John Mayer and I remember at the time thinking oh wow you know he's got this famous guitar playing dad and he's listening to John Mayer um and John Mayer is a great guitar player that's not my point I just was like oh it's a shame he's not going back but he did go back and I realized that you know John Mayer's the gateway drug you know if you can if John <laughs> Mayer is putting out a great album yeah like Continuum and kids are buying Continuum and then looking at it and listening to it and then reading some articles with John Mayer and John Mayer's talking about Albert King or Freddie King and all of these great players. And it makes them go back and buy those albums or listen to those things and research it. Then, then God bless him. You know, it's, 
Because mm. that, that yeah, you know, I didn't wake up one morning going knowing who Robert Johnson was. I woke up one morning, you know, get a Queen were the first band I listened to a rock. Then the next bands were, you know, Zeppelin, and then I got to Cream, and then I read the liner notes and saw Robert Johnson, and then I went back and found out who Robert Johnson was. So you know, I'm the same as everybody else. The, the other side of the coin for for me is that you know, you got to. I, I I kind of uh, I'm. I'm scared of of uh, musical snobbery, let's say, because I uh, like w w when I when I grew up, like uh, I had a, a long old uh, phase as a jazz musician, and I and I learned from and played with some of the top jazz players in London, and uh, and you know, as you probably all know, there's a can sometimes be a certain amount of like musical snobbery in in jazz circles, and. Uh, and and also not you know there's a, especially in jazz right now there's actually a, there's a great deal of openness to to new frontiers and whatnot so so it's a pretty cool scenario right now but like the other side the other side of the coin you know for me is that you you got to also respect that music evolves and new generations you know are inspired by not not the thing that was inspired by the thing that you liked you know like things develop con continuously and uh, not everybody's going to go all the way back to robert johnson to find the source of of everything you know uh, and 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 i i feel that you know i don't know it, to some degree you also have to respect that uh, that things evolve and and that pe and that new generations they they just they, they they have one thing that they latch onto and then they build something else and 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 couldn't care less about where it all came from and I don't know do you know what I mean like I, I just uh, oh yeah I, I for, agree for me, for me it's like because uh, I'm you know somebody who loves to go all the way back and appreciate the roots of everything as well but like but but uh, because like I've, I've 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 seen and probably been a bit of a jazz snob as well at some point in my life I'm like. I, I really re try to not do that. Uh, well, I think now, I think now the mediums have changed from when you, we all were kids. When we were kids, you know, which is pretty much anybody over, you know, when was the revolution of the internet? Probably Windows ninety five. That's when the whole world changed. Yes, the internet existed a few years before that, but really Windows ninety five. When suddenly there was affordable computers, you could go online. You know, how, however slow you could go online, but even then you couldn't download music. I remember trying to download an MP3 in like '98. It was like an hour or something. You know, oh, depending really? on your internet. Yeah, you know what I mean. It wasn't. It wasn't like now where you can stream. But here we are in this incredible world where we can access things pretty quickly. Like my son's 13, and his favorite bands are all over the map. And last year, when he was 12, I got in a car with him to go and buy some food. And he's like, Dad, can I plug in my phone? He plugs in his phone through the car and he played Donald Fagan Nightfly. And I got teary-eyed. <laughs> I'm like, my 12-year-old on his own just found Donald Fagan and started explaining to me what all the songs are about. But then he's totally eclectic. He can go and he can go and find out what Donald Fagan listened to to find out what the jazz players that he was influenced on that made him make that record. That's awesome. But he also knew the history and he's like, yeah, he's talking about like the post-nuclear age, you know, like in the 50s and blah, 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 and what was going on. And I'm like, uh-huh, uh-huh. I'm getting all like cheery-eyed, you know. He's under, he's really researching it, but he's just indicative of where kids are now. With Now with us, when we were kids, you'd find a band and maybe you'd buy all, once you fell in love with the band, you'd buy all the records. And then you'd maybe research, you know, what other band, you know, that... I remember when I got into Free, I went out and bought Backstreet Crawler after I bought all the Free records to find the Paul Kossoff solo records. But that was like six months later, you know what I mean? <laughs> Nowadays, I would go, I'd go and fi go to Fire and Water now on Spotify. Somebody would say, all right, now. I'd go and find Fire and Water, probably fall in love with the album because why the heck not? It's a masterpiece. <clears throat> but I'd read the, the notes on the Spotify, Paul Kossoff, click on the link to Paul Kossoff, scan some songs, Backstreet Corolla, Maybe find out that, oh, this guy called Rabbit, or he played in this other band. And then before you know it, you're probably listening to prog rock. You know what I mean? Because of all these other musicians that were on Island and doing all this other stuff. And uh, I, you couldn't do that when we were kids. You know what I mean? It's true, it's, and it's faster now. So they find like, you know, yeah. oh, if you like this, you might like mm -hmm. that. And, you know, things get recommended to you on the, you know, by the algorithms and stuff. And it just is all very, yeah, you, you can do, you can do in, in 24 hours now what, what used to take us a year to figure out. But I was going to yeah. say... Um, your your point about mayor, I just wanted to come back to for a second because, uh, Andy, 
uh, I told him this once because it's 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 a really special thing I think that he did, um, and it, it dawned on me when I saw him playing one of his blues trio concerts. It was a video that they made, I guess, or DVD or whatever uh, that I saw at I think it was at Staples Center here in L.A. or something. And so I'm thinking about his path to get to there, where he does a blues trio in an arena. <laughs> um, you know, he was really brilliant because I think he he realized probably early on that um, had he gone that blues route like initially, he would be another. I don't I don't want to say like a, I mean I'll name names about about blue about blues players that came after Stevie Ray Vaughan. That you know what I mean. I don't want to do that. But there's a there's a few guys out there that he would have been just like one of those guys. Like had his little you know blues trio career or whatever. And uh, instead he's like, hey, I can write good pop songs and play acoustic guitar and stuff. And and that's what he did. You know, and he he got himself to the level where he was virtually kind of invincible and could do what make whatever kind of record you wanted to make right and so fast forward all yeah. these years later he's playing staple center or whatever with a blues trio with pino on bass and you know it's like it's unbelievable you know and i look steve out steve jordan on drums steve yeah. jordan on drums i mean it's incredible and you look yeah. out at the audience <laughs> and it's everybody's under the age of 35 you know and it's mostly girls and he's playing blues you know and i thought to myself and, I, and like I said, I told him this one section, I said, you know, you did a great service for the guitar and for blues because it's like you are that guy. Now, not that long ago, a couple of years ago, I interviewed uh, Matteo Sassato, and he said, uh, he's an unbelie unbelievable guitar player who now has the respect of John and pretty much the whole guitar playing community. And he said John was the guy, because he used to play metal. He was mainly a metal guy. Uh, nothing wrong with that, but then he got interested in, in you know, he discovered Mayer and that sound. And... And he said it kind of turned his head around. He said, I didn't know Hendrix. I didn't know Steve Ray Vaughan. I didn't, it's not even that far back. You know, he said it was Mayer for me that brought me around to that sound. And then I started to go back and listen and discover all these other guitar players. So exactly what you're just saying. And he did that for a lot of, you know, a, a lot of people. That's fantastic. Yeah. 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 So he's, he's really, you know, he's, a, he's, a, he's an influential guy. And we think about him, you know, because of our age, probably think about him still as almost like a, I mean, I remember him opening for Five for Fighting when I was a, a touring as a sideman with the band Five for Fighting. And John was a, opening for us, you know. I remember that. That's like that doesn't feel that long yeah. ago. You know, there was a time that you guys will probably remember in music where, uh, you know, when when there was still big labels and people putting out records and <laughs> you know in physical form and stuff, uh, where things would be said like, "Oh, there's no." Uh, there's no uh, uh, female singers fronting rock bands right now. You can't do that. That's not what's cool. Well, one of the one of the, you know what I mean, which is so ridiculous when we think about that now. That 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 the trends and stuff and the way they used to happen. One of the one of those trends. Yeah, the was, there's no self perpetuating myth, isn't it? Yeah, it's so stupid. Yeah, and, and then somebody comes along they, they and busts that it, wide yeah, open. Yeah, they say it, and so it becomes real. Yeah, these business people, you know, certain A and R people yeah. and stuff. And one of these things was. Uh, and this relates back to Five for Fighting, was, well, there's no male singer-songwriters. That's not cool. You have to be a band. You have to have a band name. Think about how crazy that is now with Bruno Mars and John Mayer, for that matter, anybody. But John Androzic at one point was told that, as I understand, uh, by by a record label. Like, yeah, you know, you gotta you got to have a band name. That's It's not, you know, you, we can't just be John Androzic. you got to have a band name. So he said, I don't know, call it my publishing company's name, which was Five for Fighting Music. Five for Fees, big hockey fan. See, five, five minutes in the penalty box for fighting. He said, I don't know, call it Five yep. for Fighting. So he became uh, a band, but really it's him. You know, it's confusing because he's That's like a, he's a singer songwriter, and it was really just some business guy telling him that he couldn't just call it John Androzic. That's what I was told by him. <laughs> but anyway. I, I totally believe it. I mean, he, 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 uh, he's definitely somebody that in, I don't know him anywhere near as well as you do. Um, I think I met him once or twice because he used one of my old studios to track piano. When I used to have Harmony, up until very recently, we had a C7 in there, and he came in and did some piano, and I think he did some maybe a demo or two, not with me engineering, but with Phil Allen. And everything I know about him, it bucks all of the trends. You know what I mean? He doesn't he doesn't fulfill any stereotypes, and it, you, 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 you've worked with him closely, so you know what I'm talking about. You know, He doesn't fulfill the, the usual kind of like... Well, you know, he doesn't fulfill any of the stereotypes, should we say. He came into it late in the game. I mean, he was in mid-30s when he had his first hit, and he was very just like, whatever, I don't know, I'm just going to make this record and, and do, you know, I think, as I understand it, like, I, he had no expectations about being, you know, like, young and starry-eyed, and I'm going to be a great big songwriter. He was like, just, he's, he's kind of a, he's kind of all business in a great way. Um, 
you know, his father is a successful businessman, and he had a, he's, he's got an accounting degree or something. I mean, he's, he's a smart guy. And so he was working, you know, at, his, at the family business and stuff, and then got this little record deal, I believe, on Aware, uh, Aware Records, and put out that, yep. uh, the, the America Town album. And that song just took off. And he was like, okay, I guess I'm doing this now. And, but, you know, he's a great, <laughs> he's a great guy and um, somebody that I really, he's the first guy to show up at rehearsal. And he, he, he really, it's like a business when you work for him as a sideman. He's like, you, sh- you show up, you play the songs. He doesn't overthink things. It's like, well, that was good. Let's just work on the ending. You play it one more time, do it. And you're in and out in like an hour and 45 minutes uh, doing a rehearsal with him. And then you go do the show and everybody goes home happy. It's very, <laughs> it flows like that. He's just very, uh, you know, it's, it's very simple and very um, straightforward way of, of doing things. And, and he also taught me the power of, uh, just through observing his career, he taught me the power of, uh, having two or three hits as opposed to one, you know. So he's got three, three or four songs. Maybe he had his Superman song that was a big song in two thousand one. After September eleven, it kind of became like the anthem for, you know, the, the emergency personnel and things like that. At uh, and and that, so that song really took off and kind of put him on the map. And then uh, he had a song called "A uh, Hundred Years," and he had another one called chances are and you know he's got about four or five hits and I, I started to realize like that's a career all of a sudden like four or five hits you can always go do gigs right you know one yep. one's not enough but a couple or three stretched over a few years and now you got yourself a career you know where um mm-hmm. but anyway it's interesting you talk about aware that's that's greg latterman who i believe was also an accountant i believe he was an accountant and he started a record label from what I remember in the mid nineties, um, he, um, just was like a taste monger. He would like find artists and he'd put out like these little, That's right. um, tapes and CDs of like his top 10 favorite songs and artists. And he, that's how he found. And he did strangely enough. He probably didn't realize this initially put out John Mayer. I think so. he was right. five for fighting. Um, yeah. yeah Matt I Kearney, that. Gusta, and he was also the phrase manager. Which is the band I work with, so he, yeah, of course, right, and, he, and all of those bands are and artists are all like organic, play instruments, don't fulfill any. They didn't fulfill whatever the scene was at the time. So obviously, a very smart man, Latterman, had a good ear, could hear a song and an artist, regardless of what was hip and trendy. Because I remember when we worked on the first Frey album. Nothing sounded like that. Everybody was like, oh, to- that's not going to work. Piano, vocal, yeah. Coldplay, they're big, but they're English. They've got this thing. You know, there was all this deal. I used to always hear about, in, in, when I go to record labels, that, yeah, you can be left of center if you come from this other country and we can import you, but in America, that's not going to work. Even with Adele, you know, you work with girl singers that were had soul and, and listened to Stax and Motown and, and knew that, and I'd work with them, and I'd bring them to labels, and they'd be like, yeah, but Adele works because she's, she's, from, she's from the UK, and we can twist it, and it gives you uniqueness. You can't do better than an American artist. I heard that from every single A&R guy. All the self-proclaimed geniuses that, you know, if we had them talking to them, would be like, I can hear a hit. I mean, the reality is, is that uh, the great American public, the world decides what a hit is. Not, not any of us, you know, not the, not the, not the, the A and R or anything, you know. That's that's the way it works. Hence, why all of the greatest trends always seem to come from nowhere. You know, the Beatles were on a comedy label, Parlophone. No other labels in in England would sign them. You know, Nirvana were on Sub Pop. I mean, it's just all of the big stuff. It, 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 we, we all know that that's the way way it works. But Quist, getting back to this. You know, musical influence is one. I think that's a great, great discussion. Like, what? Why did you pick up the guitar? What was it? What did you hear that was like, "That's it. I want to be a guitar player." Uh, uh, my dad, actually, my dad was playing. Yeah, I had there was an acoustic uh, at home, so uh, uh, that was that. But I, I caught the stage bug before I caught the guitar bug. I started uh, performing uh, when I was about six or seven as a ballet dancer. Uh, with the Royal Ballet wow. of, De- of Denmark, so I, st- I started both both touring and uh, performing for uh, large crowds when I was like wow. a-, a tiny little uh, kid. So that need for validation and uh, <laughs> you know thirst for attention 
it uh, it it uh, unfortunately it started pretty early, and I haven't been able to switch it off ever since. So. <laughs> wow, and 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 just dedication and practice, because my my grandmother, my dad's dad's uh, mother was was a ballet dancer, and by the time I met her, obviously, you know, when I was born, she was very retired. But I mean, she told me what it was like to be a ballet dancer, and just how. Unbelievably it, physically hard. It's a, it's, it was. a, it's a pretty crazy world. Yeah, I, I, I always say, you know, I'm super glad that I was in that world, and I'm super glad that I left that world because, uh, because <laughs> I, I, you know, I, I learned a lot of discipline and I learned a lot about like, you know, hard, hard, like work ethic and uh, and discipline and stuff like that. But, but I also saw that you know that it's probably that it wasn't how I wanted to spend my whole life. Um, but you know. Uh, tremendous respect for anybody in the in in that world you know because it's uh it, it's it's hard it's man it's hard work uh, and they really uh, live for their art uh the same way that many musicians do you know but maybe musicians just have a different you know everybody thinks musicians are like hey you know uh just like uh prancing around uh rich and famous and uh just like a little bit of playing here and there or whatever but you know the actual life of most musicians is like you were saying with steven tyler it's like an insane amount of dedication and hard work goes into actually doing it uh, well. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. It's not the whole money that, for nothing uh, uh, um, stereotype. You know, you know, the realities of being a musician is uh, even for people that do it very successfully. You know, uh, is 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 so very different than than what most people uh, think it is, isn't it? And uh, and yeah, for, for ballet, it's uh, it's 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 a world that also has you know an insane amount of work behind the scenes. Same way. So, but yeah, you know, it, it, it is what it is. Um, did you, how did you guys uh, come into the, the, the guitar uh, playing side of things? I started uh, when I was about 10 and I got interested in music because of a kid that moved into my neighborhood and uh, was a few doors down for me. He was an older kid, a few years older than me. And I just was like, kind of like fascinated, you know, so it almost like became like an older brother sort of figure for a few years. And he started playing music for me. And got me interested in in uh, you know he had a huge record collection first of all, um, so he was playing me all this crazy stuff from the Beach Boys and the Beatles to Van Morrison and the Who and all and all this great music, and I was like ten nice. so yeah and I didn't have anybody like that uh, you know that was introducing me to things like that so that so that was amazing, and then he showed me my first few chords on guitar. Yeah, which was can't explain by the who he showed me how to play those power chords, you know, and and, nice. and, and and I could basically play that like right out of the gate, and I was like, oh my god, that sounds like the song. That's amazing. And then I was hooked, you know. <laughs> so and uh, and I just went from there. That's how that's how I got started, really. Yeah. And then I had my sister who was really into the sort of you know British heavy metal wave that was going on then, listening to Iron Maiden and Judas Priest, and and she was really into Thin Lizzy and always ahead of the oh. curve with like early Metallica and stuff. She was like really a metalhead, and she was like hearing and hard rock, and so I was hearing that like right when it was coming out and uh, from her, and then I had my friend Bob that was sort of more the sophisticated muso that was playing me Van Morrison, Frank Zappa, and stuff like that. Nice. <laughs> so both those sides. Oh, yeah. He gave you Frank Zappa as well. Yeah, he was playing me all kinds of stuff. I mean, if I look at there, I still have all my records from back then. The very first record I ever bought with my own money was Breakfast in America by Supertramp. Uh, so that would give you, you know, when I was like 10, I was like, you know, he'd be like, go get this record, get that, and you know, listen to this and listen. And he was 14 or something. So he was very sophisticated for being uh, a young kid. And he played great piano. I remember that. He could, he could just... You know, and he was in bands and stuff. And so it was just like this, you know, he was a little bit of a, probably like savant, I don't know, like on the spectrum a little bit or something. He was a little socially like withdrawn and stuff, but he would hang out with me. He was nice enough to, you know, to teach me all this stuff about music. So that's how, that's how it happened for me. How about you, Warren? It's, it, it's an old story for anybody that knows me. It was uh, Brian May because my, I was super, super young and my dad was, uh, um, there was lots of music in my house, but it was all classical music, 99% classical with some jazz. Um, and so I grew up on that. And, and, you know, TV in England at the time in, in the UK was, I think it was three channels. I think it was BBC One, BBC Two and ITV. It was before Channel 4 came out in like, uh, I think, early 80s. So like little kid, I'm talking like couldn't play guitar, wouldn't be able to hold it kind of kid. My dad 
bought a night at the opera and gave it to me as a Christmas present. And he literally gave it to me and said, he's a man of few words. He goes, this is worthy. <laughs> like, <laughs> like you're allowed to listen to this. This will fit in with all the Mozart and Beethoven and Shostakovich and, you know, all that stuff that's being played every day. I mean, it was literally, my dad was a painter. He was an artist. So it was all probably a little overwhelming when I look at it now as a kid, but that's just how I grew up. Everything was like super all about arts and everything. And so I put on a pair of my dad's big old fashioned Sony headphones, you know, which is probably about this big and just listened to the whole of side one of, of, of a night of the opera and was just like, what is this? And I remember specifically opening up the cover and seeing all these men with like these long hair. And, and then I remember <laughs> the inside sleeve is all in color. And there's all like photos on the inside, you know, the, the, with the and and reading the lyrics and and I remember there was this phrase that said no synthesizers uh, are being used on this record, and I remember didn't, not even knowing what a synthesizer was and having to find out there was no internet, you know, and and, and why was that a big deal that there was no synthesizers? <laughs> and now of course we all, <laughs> yeah. you know, of course we all know now it's because they used to think that all of those incredible harmony guitar sounds and everything where he was using a treble booster and and then the D, the DK amp, you know. Um, um, we, they thought that that all must have been done with a synth. They didn't realize it was all done because of the guitar sounds that Brian May was 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 um, was creating. And, and so I didn't know. I just knew that whatever that was, whatever was going on here, was what I wanted to do. I, I didn't. So I was too young to really even know. And so for the longest time, I didn't learn the guitar. Um, I just got obsessed with music. So, of course, you know, I, I, I remember being super young and standing outside. Do you remember Boots the Chemist, Quist? Yeah, of course, yeah. Well, they used to sell records in my home in my hometown. I lived in a village, oh, but really? the nearest town, there was two record stores. There was Boots, well, three technically, because there was Boots the Chemist that sold records, Woolworths, for those of you who remember Woolworths. I know they had Woolworths in Canada. And uh, a little tiny... Um, uh, um, little tiny record shop called the Record Box, which was pretty much as only as wide to have two rows of records and you walk down the middle and you bump into people. And But I remember standing outside Boots the Chemist, super young, to buy jazz the day it came out because I got the enemy and I knew Queen Jazz was coming out and I'm just a little kid standing outside waiting for it to open to go in. Cause I, I didn't know whether it was going to be a line of people. I just had to get the album. So it was, it was definitely all Brian May. And Brian May was my gateway drug. Right. You know, I, I, I read in The Enemy in an interview, because he's always been really, really humble and really good at giving props. He said, oh, you know, everybody's like, wow, you've got this amazing guitar sound. He's like, yeah, you know, he talks about his dad building the guitar with him. But then he said, my guitar sound is all Rory Gallagher. And he talked about AC30 with a treble booster. And I didn't know what that meant, but I knew that Rory Gallagher must be good because Brian May, who's in this really great band, so I go and buy a Rory Gallagher album, and that's what got me into blues. Oh, so cool. it's like, because then I'm listening to like an Irish incredible strat playing, you know, didn't know any of these things, but you know, and I'm hearing blues and blues rock and and yeah, so it's like that was my gateway drug. So that's that's awesome. Yeah. Hey, that reminds me. I wanted to ask you guys what what do you think. Of like because I'm imagining you sitting there, you know, reading reading album covers and uh, you know digging into the to the to the artwork and stuff like that. What do you guys think about the um, the sort of current and by current I mean in the last year or or, or so the last year or two, like this drive to uh, um, give credit to musicians and to kind of change the the dynamic around how 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 musicians are credited uh, in general because you know. Like very few people take time to read on the internet or to, or, or they, they can't actually, you know, uh, digest who, who's playing on the albums uh, on Spotify or, or whatever, yeah. you know, like what, 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 do you, what are you guys thoughts on, on like how, I think it was a, the recording academy that, you know, had a, a thing where they, everybody was posting like stuff they played on or like listed, you know, things with uh, like certain, uh, certain tracks and said, this is such and such person played on it and to kind of, you know, try and, And, uh, and 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 bring some of that back, some of that uh, credit back to, to the musicians playing on all this music. Well, I, well, it's 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 a crazy thing to me that it's just not a thing that on iTunes there's just a little tab you can click on where you can read the liner notes or look at the album art. You know, I don't understand like that whole like that was a great 
awesome. I, I wanted to know where it was recorded and who mastered it. And For me too, it was part of the power. Like you, you were sitting there with a thing and looking at it and you were reading all this stuff and it felt like a whole world that you'd get consumed in. And and, uh, and the, the visual aspect was, it was part of it, you know, whether it was like n naked ladies with Guns N' Roses uh, records or, or whatever it was, but you got sucked into you got sucked into it. I mean, I have this clear memory. I told you about my friend Bob that got me into music. I've got a clear memory of him sitting me in a chair and saying, okay, because I was a little kid. I was younger. I mean, I was 10 or whatever, but he was like 13, 14. He's like, just sit there. You don't have to fidget or screw around here and handing me like probably Sgt. Peppers or whatever and going read look at this put like maybe putting a headphones on my head is my memory or something you know maybe i can't remember if that happened or not, but that's kind of my memory is like either it was the big speakers in his from his stereo or it was the headphones just sit there for listen to the whole side of the album and read and handing me the liner notes at the same it was a package that he taught me you know right from yeah, yeah, day yeah. one like and that's yeah. and and now you know um it's funny because even the way that uh, people listen these days, you know, my my girlfriend's younger than me, and I've had to kind of like in the in the car. She's very fast, as a lot of people are on Spotify and on skipping around and going to the different, you know. Oh, check this out! Check this out! And I get so pissed right, off because right. I'm like, just play the song. I just and, and I know it's not. <laughs> she's not. It's not her fault. It's like the way that people listen. Just I want to hear the whole. No, 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 no! Don't change it. The chorus is coming. I want to hear what happens next. Like we can just listen to the whole album. You know, we don't got to skip around. And it's that, uh, you know, but I know that that's the way the, the culture of these is, is fast, fast, fast yeah, in I mean, the first 30 seconds. It's, it's, it's like tick, TikTok without, you know, us sounding like old farts suddenly. But it's like, uh, you know, TikTok is even more in that direction because it's like, uh, oh, you know, it's, it's these tiny little snippets. Yep. Uh, so music is becoming tinier and tinier, you know, <laughs> yeah. in terms of how, pe how much people are willing to sit down and, uh, and, and really digest a, a piece of work. But I have a question, a couple of things. For instance, I... I Pete, I saw a video you did um, maybe a year ago, and it was probably part of the discussion, but I agree with you 100%, and you and I, and I'm sure Quist and, and a handful of people are going to buck the trend on this, but you, somebody asked you, I think it was in one of your uh, Sunday videos, somebody asked you what you thought about you know, people being demonetized for playing other people's songs, and you... You answered in, and I'm sorry if I paraphrase you, but you answered in a way which I 100% agree with. All of us here, all three of us here, um, have careers through hard work and practice and learning and stuff, but we also have careers because we've been blessed to work with incredibly talented people who have brought them, brought us into their world, whether it's me being able to produce or engineer or work with an amazing artist or you guys being able to like play on the same stage. This is why we have careers and we're all very thankful. So your perspective was pretty much like, I think mine as well. It's like, ultimately, if I do a video and I call it, you know, the making of Bohemian Rhapsody and talk about Bohemian Rhapsody and play, you know, all of the guitar parts. And if Queen decide to me that they want to demonetize their, my video, so what? They wrote the song. People are watching my video because it's got Queen and Bohemian Rhapsody in there. I'm not going to have this illusion that suddenly I'm this genius because, you know what I mean? And I remember somebody asked you that and you sort of responded maybe not as bluntly as that, but you, you I agreed with you because... We have to remember that this is somebody's art and creation, creation, and they put so much of their life and spirit into it. And the idea that, oh, yeah, but they've already got a million dollars. Who cares? I don't care if they got one dollar or a million dollars. The respect level, going back to what we were talking about earlier, should be the same for somebody up and coming and somebody successful. The art and the creation is the most important part of this, I think. Yeah, I mean, they, they wouldn't have had a million dollars had they not had a, a revenue stream there that, that, you know, and it's like that was always kind of like, like mm -hmm. the, the, the art ceases to exist exist if we don't support the so i think that the issue lies with you know folks making like a, a bohemian rhapsody sort of appreciation or video there should be like an educational uh you know like where you're allowed to do that and it doesn't get you know some sort of copyright strike and taken down that's an issue but the revenue should go to or at least be shared with obviously the the, yeah. the creator i totally agree with that you know it's both things should be sort of protected i think from an educational standpoint it'd be sh a shame if people couldn't make a sort of a you know, because like, it's where do you draw the line with that? Because it's like you could teach a you know in a in a, in a music college sort of setting or something you, appreciation class you could teach about you know the you know, Sergeant Peppers or something. But all of a sudden you put the video up, 
on and then it, and then it maybe gets this a strike or whatever gets pulled down that's unfortunate i think but yeah the, the, definitely yeah. The- gentlemen thank you ever so much that was so much fun i've learned a lot about you and again i, I, I we wanted to do this mutually because we realized we're all sort of you know cut from very similar cloth we we we, we feel blessed to be able to work in this music industry it's pretty darn amazing yeah, man. It's been a joy, been a joy guys. guys. Thank you so much, man. Appreciate it. I appreciate you, Chris. Appreciate you, Warren. And uh, it's uh, it's been enlightening for me as well. I've, uh, it's great to get together and and uh, and talk about where people come from and and uh, uh, you know to see that there's a lot of similarities as well as differences, you know, in in our paths. It's really cool. Marvelous. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. It's been a joy, guys. Let's do it again soon. Thank you. Yep, do it again soon. Thank you, everybody, for watching. Please leave a bunch of comments and questions below. If there's stuff that you want us specifically to talk about, please do. Is there new gear that we need to know about that we didn't know about? That's always great, whether it be guitars, amps, pedals, cables, strings, picks, everything. Microphones for recording guitars. Let us know. Amp sims, plugins. Just let us know. We'd love to be able to uh, talk about all of these great new products that come out on a daily basis. Let's get geeky. Mm-hmm.